Hello, everyone. So, the former United States President Barack Obama said that the U.S. has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. Let's think about that for a second. The 13th Amendment was the amendment in the United States Constitution that supposedly abolished slavery. It basically says, unless you're branded a felon or a criminal, slavery cannot and will not exist in the United States. But it was that very same amendment that allowed slavery to restructure itself and manifest itself in American culture for almost a century now. So to begin with, at the end of slavery, the Southern economy was completely shattered, which led to America's first prison boom. They arrested African Americans for very minor crimes, like vagrancy or loitering, and they used prisoners to rebuild their own economy. This is when the movie The Birth of a Nation came out, and it basically told the white side of the story to the Civil War and its aftermath. And that's what really demonized and criminalized the image of the black male that we see in society today. It was also the rebirth of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which is basically a white supremacist group located in Southern America, and its main goal was to suppress the newly acquired rights of black people after the civil rights movement. And because of the following, hundreds of black people were mobbed and killed, many of which took the forms of lynchings or hangings. As a matter of fact, a lot of the population that you can see in places today like LA, New York, Detroit, they moved as refugees from the terrors that were taking place in the South at the time. This is when the Jim Crow law came about. And a lot of you might know about it. There were different places where you could drink, different places where you could eat, even different places where you could get your education. And that's what really paved the way for mass incarceration to take place in today's world. Now, this is when a lot of civil rights activists started to stand up and they were criminalized for standing up for what they believed in. And because of the subsequent higher arrest rates, that was politicians' excuse to criminalize the civil rights movement even more. And at that moment, the perpetual loop of slavery was conceived. Now, at this time, in 1970, this was the number of criminals in the United States. Now, this is when Richard Nixon came into office, and he used the war on crime and the war on drugs as tools to fight back against movements that he didn't like, like gay liberation, women's rights, even the Black Panthers. And he used this tool which later became the Southern Strategy, which is where, where Nixon took Southern whites and brainwashed them, in a sense, by using non-racial and subtle terms. And he talked about the need for law and order. So, Nixon's advisors came up with a plan. John L. Richmond, one of his advisors, said that by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, they could disrupt communities, they could vilify people night after night on the evening news. And at this time, in 1980, this was the amount of supposed criminals in the United States. Now, this is when Ronald Reagan became president of the United States, and he, turned, uh, he took the phrase, war on drugs, from a figurative battle into a literal war. This is when crack cocaine and powder cocaine was created. And crack cocaine was created and exploited in African-American communities, and powder cocaine was exploited in more sophisticated white areas. As a matter of fact, um, the same amount of time you would get in prison for one ounce of crack cocaine, you could get for 100 ounces of powder cocaine. And at that moment, the perpetual loop of slavery was legalized. Now, in 1990, this was the amount of criminals in the United States. Now, because of the very unfortunate abduction and murder of the young girl Polly Class, this led to the even more unfortunate three strikes you're out law, which was introduced by Bill Clinton. This law ultimately meant that after your third crime committed, you would be incarcerated for the rest of your waking days. And Bill Clinton used this law to govern a country that still had Reagan's ideology. At this point, there were so many uh, criminals that had committed their third felony that California prisons had to release 4,200 inmates every single month just so judges could keep up with the brand new workload. So this is when Congress came out with the Federal Crime Bill of 1994, and that nearly costed them $30 billion. 
This crime bill was responsible for the massive expansion of the prison system, from, from giving money and incentives for what could be considered abusive actions to providing corporations with almost free labor. And at that moment, the perpetual loop of slavery was militarized. In short, what President Clinton did in 1994 was much more harmful than any one of his predecessors. He's responsible for the prison infrastructure that we see today, from SWAT teams to local police departments. And at this time, in 2014, this was the amount of criminals in the United States. Now this is where a very key organization called ALEC plays in, the American Legislative Exchange Council. In short, ALEC is a private club, and its members are politicians and corporations. Through ALEC, corporations get to propose laws to their political counterparts. In short, corporations are operating in our legislation, operating in prisons, and benefiting from other people's punishment. Now, the US criminal justice system treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. 97% of all those locked up have plea bargains. A typical scenario could be the prosecutor saying, you know, we can make a deal and we'll get you three years, or you can go to trial and we'll get you 30. You wanna take that chance? Feel free. A lot of people are locked up just because they have the audacity not to take a plea bargain and fighting for what they believe in. And we're doing very little of anything to rehabilitate them for when they re-enter civil society. Instead, we just shun them. That question, have you ever been convicted of a felony, follow these inmates for the rest of their lives. It appears on private licenses, business licenses, even life insurance. In retrospect, so many elements of the old Jim Crow become abruptly legal again once you've been branded a criminal. And so it seems in America we haven't so much ended racial caste, but simply redesigned it into its former glory. A lot of people say all the time, well, I don't know how people could have lived with slavery. How did people make sense of that? This white and colored only drinking, that's so crazy. If I was living at that time, I would have never submitted to anything like that. But the very sad truth of the matter is, guess what, everyone? We are living in those times right now, and we are tolerating it. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.